Um, Henry, thanks for lunch, and uh, it, it's, it's great to see you all. I was, um, Evan and I were talking about this a couple days ago. We said, okay, we'll try to divvy it up a little bit between uh, descriptive look and um, maybe a little more prospective look at implications and where we might be going out in the future. Um, I'll just say, admittedly, this is highly speculative. Um, so feel free. I'm really, I'd much rather have a discussion than you know, just sit here and drone on. Um, but anything I say is probably highly debatable. I hope it sparks uh, a conversation or an argument. Um, and there's a really excellent chance you're right and I'm wrong. I'll go ahead and say that up front. Um, as John Water might say, I have low confidence in everything that I'm about to tell you. Uh, it's not very well sourced. The, uh, the sources that I do have have reported unreliably in the past. So. Um, the other thing I want to say up front is uh, I look around at the expertise in the room. And there's no possible way in you know, seven to 10 minutes, Evan and I could hit every possible topic related to the word missiles, uh, either in terms of there being more of them or there being uh, a lot better missiles in the future. Um, whether we're talking about the strategic uh, uh, competition between uh, the, the great powers, particularly Russia and the United States, thinking about heavy ICBMs, thinking about avant-garde, thinking about going underneath ballistic missile defenses with status six, I'm going to save that for conversation if you'd like to talk about it. I see Pete Hayes sitting over here who's lost uh, more or forgotten more about space than I will ever know. Um, so, you know, a really important part of this whole discussion is the growth and the radical commercialization and, and democratization of space and our access to it. I'm not going to go into that now, but, um, you know, I'd actually, any questions that come up, let's ask Pete. Um, so the thing, the thing I do want to hit on, I, I do want to hit on three points today, and, and these um, hopefully kind of dovetail with with um, with Evan's excellent tee up. The first is maybe to speculate a little bit, just because it's in the news these days. This idea of what a post INF world might look like, and where we might be going with that, if it's of interest. And then the second, um, which is a hobby horse of mine, is uh, what do missiles mean for the U.S. military. Uh, and I, I think there's some really profound changes that are afoot, and I want to go into those. And then I'm going to close out by talking about just broader international security and, and you know, how you contextualize uh, missiles um, in, a, in, a, in a broader discussion. So with respect to um, post-INF, um, I think that there are, you know, it's, a, it's, it's complicated whether you want to get out of the treaty or stay in it, and I would say that paradoxically, you know, the more prepared you are to get out of it, the more likely it is that you actually could have stayed in it and, and vice versa. But the, you, there's this requirement for some strategic flexibility or mental flexibility in terms of how we think about that. And that was there from, from the president. When I was in graduate school, I was Paul Nitz's research assistant. And we used to talk a lot about this, um, that you know, the steps we took with dual track and the paradox of dual track is what led you to the negotiating table. Um, and so I wouldn't completely give up on that today. And I'm not, uh, I'm not someone who's, uh, I don't have a, um, a union card for the arms control community, and at the same time, I'm not opposed to arms control. Um, I think that it goes kind of hand in glove with steps that you're going to take in terms of your military force plan. So all that said, I want to start talking about the region where I think this matters most, and that's Asia, not Europe. Um, despite the fact that this is a bilateral treaty between the United States and Russia, What's really driving this is what's going on in the Western Pacific, uh, that you have this highly asymmetric situation. China's been going gangbusters for 20 years, building up land-based uh, INF-class uh, ballistic and cruise missiles. Um, and there's been really no uh, redress by, by the United States or its allies uh, in, in the Western Pacific. So I think here, more than any other place in the world, INF-class systems uh, on the part of the United States and its allies probably make some sense. Um, and I was thinking through, you know, what do you do with them? And you know, here's what I'd throw out uh, as food for thought. I mean, the first, I think, is um, Evan got into you know, where we're going. And one of the trend lines we see is that you know, the idea of just you know, cooking off uh, you know, one Roman candle is not very interesting anymore. It's going to become a Stalvo competition. Um, this requires a lot better battle management, both on the part of the of the offense in terms of how you know in the past we talk about you know the con you know one of the principles of warfare is concentration, concentration of your of your forces, and we always really assume that that's done 
in terms of concentration in geospace. What we're really talking about with the salvo is concentration in time. So within a short time window, I have to be able to synchronize, coordinate, and launch effectively uh, some reasonable salvo that can saturate or overwhelm the defenses of the adversary. So that's kind of, a, that's kind of an interesting problem. So one of the things I would say is that you know, INF-class systems deployed by the United States and its allies could help me in terms of counter salvo or count, you know, what we would have called in the past counter battery. But my ability to screw you up at the tactical level in terms of you are more conscious of the fact that there's a hypersonic system that's coming after you or that I have something with pretty short time of flight that can get to you before you're able to pack up and, and haul ass out of you know, wherever you are to get to your next high site. Um, and so, you know, I've got probably uh, uh, an op a window of opportunity that's measured in, in minutes, order of magnitude, you know, 10 to the first, um, in which I can, I can affect your calculations and screw up your salvo. That's not a silver bullet, but it does buy me something in terms of my, in it, it takes some of the pressure off my integrated air and missile defenses, because that's the other part of this, is the defensive missile part. Um, and how do I use those systems more effectively uh, and essentially, you know, work at winnowing down that salvo that I face at each step. I think the second area that looks really attractive is really just kind of copycatting what the Chinese are doing, which is the Chinese, you know, they, I mean, there were two interpretations on Desert Storm. One was the American one, which is, you know, these PGMs and having STU-3s and satellite communications. This stuff, we're just going to overlay like peanut butter across our whole joint force, and it's just going to make us more awesome at everything. We were totally wrong. Mm. The Chinese looked at it and said, well, number one, we've just been vicariously defeated. All this Warsaw Pact crap doesn't work terribly well. Static defenses don't work terribly well. But this PGM stuff's really interesting, not for the offense, for doing kind of transoceanic power projection the way the Americans fantasize about, but for stopping transoceanic power projection. This is how we break tip fits. This is how we break S pods and A pods. Could you uh, not use acronyms? What do those things mean? Uh, air, <laughs> air and sea points of debarkation. And uh, TIPFIT is a time-phased uh, force deployment data, which is basically the logistics flow into a theater. Now, I have to say, I still don't know what that means. But I'm, impressed. So, I'm impressed that but what you I would knew say what each one of those letters meant. Well, let me do it. I'm saying they're focused on breaking our, our logistics en route, and they, there are two choke points, you know, classes of choke points when you go into a theater in, in expeditionary warfare. You're going to either go through an airport or you're going to go through a seaport. Um, and I'm planning on taking missiles and smashing the hell out of both of those classes of, of targets. Um, and if you do that, and if we're not already in theater, you can win by fait accompli. And so that's really the point. Um, so I think the Chinese got this right, and I think the Americans fundamentally got the diagnosis of, of Desert Storm wrong. So I am a dyed-in-the-wool you know, groupie when it comes to uh, PLA doctrine. I think these guys are really good. And all I can say is, if you can't beat them, join them. So how do we adopt our own kind of friendly A2AD or our own friendly counter power projection? And their missiles are going to figure prominently. But one of the best things I can use them for is counter maritime power projection. So you have what John Mearsheimer and, and Evan would call the stopping power of water. Um, I want to use that to my advantage. And in the first island chain uh, in, the, in the western, the far western Pacific, um, it's hard to move at more than about 40 knots by sea. Uh, and you know, those are generally going to be ships with very high signatures that I can hold at risk with missile forces. Um, I can do what the second artillery or the, the PLA rocket forces cause, blockades by fire. Uh, so I can, I can influence your shipping, not only in terms of naval shipping, but also commercial shipping. Uh, if you're uh, an aspiring maritime power, this not only poses problems for you in the, in the current conflict, if we were in a war, uh, but it holds out the prospect that you may not have a navy or you may not have a commercial fleet when the war is over, which sets you back over the next quarter century as you try to rebuild that. I think holding the fleet at risk is the low-hanging fruit. That's the easiest thing we can get at, and I think missiles are you know, ideally suited for that. And then the third thing I was thinking about is kind of picking up on Evan's point earlier. We said, you know, missiles are awesome. Um, you know, we can, you know, what Bob Work has said is, you know, we can achieve accuracy independent of, of, of uh, range, but we can't achieve range independent of cost. And the longer range your missile is, the more it costs. Um, I just saw a figure for 
Um, thinking about like ground-based strategic deterrent, um, you're looking in the probably low hundred million dollar figure versus an IRBM like a DF21D, you're probably at about 10 million. So that's a big step function increase to go from an IR to an IC. Um, but one of the things that occurs to me then, if missiles are relatively expensive against aircraft, and if bombers for efficiency are just kind of the, you know, the most cost-effective way of dropping a lot of stuff on somebody, um, one of the things you want to want to use your missiles for, and this is kind of the third mission I'd highlight, is um, offensive counter-air. But I want to go smash air bases, and I want to keep them down over time. This is what the Chinese are thinking about with the counter-intervention strategy, holding Kadena at risk, holding potentially Anderson at Guam at risk, and things like that. We would want to think about something similar. Of course, you've got to do all of this recognizing that, you know, for big powers, they probably have nuclear weapons as well. So there's this Goldilocks problem in terms of how hard you actually hit somebody before they get angry. And that's a really big uh, concern in this missile competition. But it, it see, the things go well until then. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a serious concern on, on all sides. And it's one that, you know, it's impossible to have a discussion about any sort of conventional conflict without thinking about the super conventional, including nuclear, as well as the subconventional of how do I just skirt all of this and use my Spetsnaz or use my active measures or whatever I'm going to do and just kind of go underneath all of these things where you can't compete effectively. So the really interesting thing is if you, if you buy into maybe we have an interest in these missions, where would you put this stuff? Um, and you know, there are going to be real concerns on the part of your allies. Um, behind closed doors, the Japanese will kind of flirt with this and say, you know, maybe, maybe one day. But we're having a hard enough time just getting just regular old F-22s and F-35s out of Kadena and moving them to the main islands of Japan. This is a much bigger lift. Um, if you had a government in the Philippines that we were on pretty good terms with, that looks, Luzon looks like an awesome place to have missiles. Palawan looks like an awesome place to have missiles, even as far as Mindanao. Um, but more likely, you're probably going to be in the second island chain uh, initially, and there, you know, you've got you've got some serious um, some serious distance limitations. But it's worth at least thinking about. I think the even more interesting thing is what might the Russians do? So if you're out of INF, I don't, th and I'll get to this point in a second talking about Europe. But in some ways, I think the earliest Russian deployments of anything would actually be in the Eastern Military District, not the Western Military District. And so I think that's actually um, we could go around and around in a conversation and have, a, I'm sure somebody will disagree with me on this point, but it would be interesting to have that conversation. Um, conscious of time, let me move ahead real quick and just stay on Europe. I think deploying INF class systems in Europe, by either, you know, either on the part of Russia or on the part of the United States, it makes a lot less strategic sense than, than an Asian deployment. I think the disincentives in Europe are pretty strong uh, for, for both of the both of the main protagonists. Um, for the US, the lack of allied support, not in my backyard, um, and uh, we just have an immediate lack of weapons, that there's some time lag in terms of, you know, we don't really have our act together for getting out of INF in some ways. Um, I think the second is, uh, when it comes to Russia, that I think um, Russia is much more cost sensitive, um, that the opportunity costs are, are even higher in, in terms of their resource constraints, but also it's a fear of response in kind. I mean, it, you, it really is kind of deja vu all over again when you go back to the 1980s and you think about dual track in both Pershing II and Griffin deployments uh, on the part of the United States, uh, Air Force and Army, that um, you know the Russians just look and say, you got short time of flight to my capital and I don't have, that, that's a favorable asymmetry for you. I would much rather uh, get, go back to the bargaining table at that point. So I, I, I don't think that has changed particularly. Um, and you know, Will probably knows better than, than anybody in this room some of that. Maybe we could talk to that after in, in the discussion. Um, to the extent that, that you would think about these things, Russia, I think, is most concerned with NATO air bases and with ballistic missile defense sites, uh, each ashore in, in, in Europe, and how those could be held up. Um, but I think, actually, Russia has other options besides missiles for how it might be able to address some of those concerns. And for the United States, I think our principal interest is going to be um, shorter range missile forces in Europe for air and sea denial, as well as for counter battery. Um, and so you know, that's how I would think about the mission sets in each of the theaters. OK, so that's on INF. Hopefully, there's something there you can disagree with, and we can have a discussion. Let me switch to thinking about the US military and force planning, because this is really my bread and butter. Um, here, I think that uh, a missile-proliferated a missile world should really prompt a radical rethinking of 
the U.S. expeditionary warfare model. That tip-fit thing I was talking about and those APODs and SPODs, that's all dead in this kind of world. I mean, it's just so easy to hold at risk. So if you care about something, you no longer are going to have 60 to 90 days uh, build up time, mobilize the reserves, you know, have them doing push-ups and getting their flu shots and anthrax. It's going to be over by then. So it, the only two things that really matter are, are what you have on site and whatever it is you're trying to defend uh, that's, frankly, more or less permanently stationed there, and the stuff that can almost immediately start, start fighting from range. Um, and so what I would argue is that the expeditionary warfare model, the joint model, really goes out the window, and you're headed for uh, a, very, uh, a very radical relook at U.S. joint roles and missions. <clears throat> In particular, I'll just focus on the biggest, the biggest one I can think of. This really is kind of like the Eddie Murphy Trading Places, Dan Aykroyd Trading Places movie. It means for the Air Force, you know, going from having all of these close-in air bases to saying, we're going to fight from range, and it's going to be a mixture of standoff and penetrating strike systems. Uh, and here, as Evan was saying, there's this trade-off between missiles are really great for kind of the onesie, twosie shots in. Maybe they're hypersonic. Maybe, you know, I've got uh, very altered trajectory systems. Um, maybe I'm using penetration aids. But I can probably get through your air defenses and go after some critical targets. Um, but if I have to go after a lot of targets over a lot of time, <laughs> bombers look pretty doggone attractive, or some system that allows me to just continue throwing junk at you in a sustained way. So that's the challenge for the um, that's the challenge for the Air Force: is how do I fight better from range? It's exactly the opposite for the Army. You know, the Army right now is all in Fort Lewis and Fort Sill and all these places. Bloom goes up; they're going to get on ships or airplanes and craft, and they'll fly into the theater. That's a thing of the past. Air Force comes back now, or they go to bases that are, you know, farther out of reach of the adversary, but the Army goes forward. You know, if you really care about the Baltics, then you better have a plan for how you're going to defend them immediately. Uh, you're not going to have two weeks to go and, 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 and work up to that, you know, and there's a lot of war gaming to support that. So if you care about something, you have to be there. And I think if you're going to park anything there, even better than heavy armor, even better than infantry forces, even better than special forces, is going to be you know, figuring out some new unit of force structure, like mobile missile fire brigades, strike brigades, uh, where you have uh, missile forces. They, they may or may not be treaty limited. But even having something with less than 500 kilometers, if I could park some of those babies right now in the Baltics uh, and Poland and Romania, I'd be far better off uh, than, our, than our current posture. They need to be mobile. You have to have survivable C2. It means you're going to have deep underground C2 headquarters. You're going to want to string fiber around. You're going to want to have some alternative comm systems. You know, kind of think of like almost like a mini NC3 posture that you'd have for your forward forces. But I think that's what you're going to need. And and for all of this, you know, if you go back to like the 1948 Key West Agreement, which kind of laid out the modern roles and missions for the U.S. military, if you read the bottom, it's a very elegant document. It's only about 13 pages long. It says here's what each service is going to do, and at the bottom it says, oh by the way. Uh, Army, you know, you'll also do some coastal defense stuff. Oh, by the way, Air Force, you know, you could also do some offensive naval mining or some anti-ship stuff. Um, and these cross-domain missions, and that's become kind of a, a, a buzzword of the day, that stuff's going to get really important. And so, you know, rethinking, you know, the, the how, what the roles and missions balances of the services, where increasingly air forces are probably your best bet for killing armies. Armies may be your best bet for killing navies, and so on and so forth. Those traits are going to have to come into the into the to the fore. So let me close on this, which is kind of thinking about broader international security implications. I think um, the first, which um, you know, I'm I'm kind of a this is my broken saw is. Uh, Power projection for everyone, the United States, China, Russia, everyone, is potentially far harder and more difficult in a world with proliferated missile forces. Because um, it's going to be a lot easier. If, if you actually take the right steps, based on the technologies that are available today, your ability to shut down someone while they're in motion trying to invade just goes up radically. Uh, you can deny them air cover. You can deny them amphibious or naval approaches. You can hold their ships at risk. You can hold tank columns at risk. I mean, you can do so many cool things that we only kind of dreamed of in the 1980s. Um, plus, 
uh, for a guerrilla campaign, you can you can distribute uh, what are called guided rocket artillery mortar and missile systems. So you know, Evan and I have been talking about this. This is kind of our dream for ten years. But imagine Hezbollah on steroids, or Hezbollah with you know precision guided mortars and missiles, where very small squads of just a couple guys, um, you know, a la the, the Wolverines and Red Dawn can go out and wreak <laughs> havoc against against armored columns invading a country. Um, this, the related point to that is, I know this is kind of a non-proliferation crowd, and I'm all about non-proliferation in general, especially when it comes to WMD and the delivery systems for WMD. But I would ask you just, like, is all proliferation bad? Because when I can think especially about shorter-range <coughs> anti-ship uh, missiles, uh, when I think about shorter range uh, land attack systems and other things, especially for kind of frontier defense, if you will, for a country maintaining its sovereignty, I think they actually look pretty doggone stabilizing. Uh, that they're not really, you know, there are different classes here, and don't get me wrong, you know, intermediate range surface to surface missiles, I think theirs are likely to create security dilemmas. Um, they lead to crisis instability. They're bad. Um, having anti-ship cruise missiles and batteries along your coast that can reach out, you know, 100 kilometers, I don't think that's such a bad thing. That might actually be stabilizing. It's a pain in the ass for us if we want to invade you. But overall, for the international system, I don't think it's that bad. Um, Evan hit on the cost point, and I think cost is going to be a bigger limiter in the future than arms control regimes are going to be. Uh, and that may be kind of a contentious point. But again, as we were saying earlier, range is going to remain pretty doggone expensive, um, and there are going to be big opportunity <laughs> costs in terms of you know how how much how much of this stuff do you want to pursue at the expense of more efficient systems, especially if you're worried about a potentially protracted conflict. And the last point, which is maybe the most complicated, and I'm going to screw it up, is you've got to think over the next 10 to 20 years about kind of an evolution in the competition. <coughs> that we're going from single shot <coughs> missiles and demonstrations to salvo, uh, to salvos, and how you defend against salvos, or how you kind of limit the damage from salvos. The next step in that, as Evan was talking about, in terms of how you go after the kill chain, the critical aspect's gonna be, you know, we're in this kind of blinding campaign race where we're each trying to counter the, the, the um, command and control communications and intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance complexes of the other. That, you know, rather than me trying to go out and fly swat each missile coming in, I'm going to try to destroy your kill chain and, while trying to preserve my own. That in turn, if you kind of imagine both sides getting really good at that, eventually you say, well, the hard thing to go after with a kill chain is something that moves. So increasingly, I'm going to fall back to holding things at risk that don't move. What are things that don't move? Well, they tend to be kind of countervalue in nature. So we may be going into a renaissance and countervalue targeting. Okay? Can I use that phrase? Renaissance, it sounds so pleasant in grinding people up in large numbers. <coughs> sure. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, let, so take that. Maybe, maybe if that's the case, then where does that take you? And so, you know, at the at the far end of my twenty year outlook, um, I think it takes you in a couple directions. One is resiliency matters a hell of a lot. Um, City states don't look very uh, secure to me. You know, if you're Israel and you're small, if you're Singapore and you're small, I think you're in real trouble. If you're a country like Australia, big landmass, but you've concentrated your population in only five cities that can all be held at risk, that doesn't look so good either. Countries that look most resilient, surprise, you know, actually are countries kind of like China and the United States. Population evenly distributed, industrial capacity evenly distributed. Um, they look like they're actually a little more resilient, especially if they make you know, the right kinds of investments. I think it also drives you back towards WMD. If, you, if the shipping costs are getting so damn expensive trying to throw something, you know, 5,000 kilometers range, you know, having some little pinprick, you know, t lamb like warhead on it doesn't make any sense anymore. Um, so it pushes you back towards um, most likely <coughs> nuclear weapons, but you can think about other, other forms of WMD. And then the last point that I'll close on is, um, I'm sorry for going on so long, is I think all of this missile stuff actually pushes you towards strategies of circumvention. That you know, you'll go through, you have no choice but to enjoin the, the missile arms race, if you will, uh, but you want to avoid overspending here, just like you'd want to avoid overspending in the strategic offense-defense relationship. 
but you've got to look at you know where what areas are buying you the most flexibility. And I think here, if you look at like Vladimir Putin's strategy of circumvention in terms of going subconventional, that looks really attractive. And I think other great powers probably follow in suit. Thank you.